Okay, well, I, I am asked to, to present in English uh, just a few minutes before we have uh, uh, the major lecture from the mayor of, uh, of Palermo. So we heard the story of a father, we heard the story of a patient. I'd just like to go very quickly back to uh, a story of somebody that has been involved in this field since 40 years. So the 25th of July, actually in 1978, two things have happened. One is uh, something that has affected uh, probably the whole world, the bone of Louis Brown. And the other one that actually has affected especially me because I've been graduated the 25th of July in 1978. But that really didn't affect me. What affected me was that as soon as I got the degree with Laude and I was walking away, my father stopped me and said, well, there is something that I'm not able to do despite I'm involved in uh, surgery, in reproductive medicine. I really would like you to think about IVF. I just heard by, in the radio that something has happened in the UK. So take this one and uh, have a look uh, to Brussels or to Australia. And he gave to me a laparoscope that I haven't seen in my life be before. So that was the beginning of my interest in, uh, in IVF. The reason why I'm saying this is that uh, it's involved really an entire group. In 1993, um, I contacted Alan Handyside and we talked about PGD and we came to the conclusion in Treviso, Alan, you remember that, that Two clinics of PGD in Europe were enough, one in UK and one in Italy. That was the conclusion of the meeting. <laughs> well, <laughs> at that time, these were the instruments that we had in our hands. So we had to start from scratch everything, including making the micro tools. And I don't want to go into the details, but I can tell you that one micro tool that you now buy, it could take even half a day before you could do a proper micro injection. So, we were going sleeping, thinking about something that could be automatized or in some way at least commercially available. When we started to talk about the possibility to check uh, the chromosomes, then I had another, another trouble in my life. I met uh, uh, Santiago Munet that was trying to explain to me how uh, PGS could work. And he was so desperate that he was only also drawing the male and female uh, chromosome in the slide saying I am a woman and I am a man, trying to, to make it clear to me. At that time uh, also the X-linked disease started to, to be possible to think about this with, with, with PGS. It was a hard work and uh, even uh, to publish was not easy. You can see in the blue part of the slide the comment on a paper that actually it took years and years to be acceptable as a concept. It was a concept of the possible interchromosomal effect in embryos generated by gametes for translocation carriers. As you see, one of the reviewers was so skeptical that he was thinking that either it was a technical mistake, either we were not saying the truth. And the same story was also when, for the first time, we started to think that uh, human embryos could bring some mosaic with themselves. Of course, the work was not accepted uh, uh, by any ethical committee in Italy, so we moved to Australia with Alan, and again, it took a while to show that human embryos, actually, with the poor material that we had in our head, could bring mosaics to us. But the most difficult thing as a gynecologist was to be accepted by the genetic community. Here you see, during uh, a review of a paper, uh, in which one of the authors commented that uh, this is the second time this wrong assumption is in the text. If you got it literally from the Generali paper you mentioned, you should not use this reference. And the comment aside, the, uh, don't laugh at and to now, the comment aside was, Dr. Generali is not a molecular biologist, but a gynecologist, and would not know a DNA sequence if it beats him in the nose. Now she's chairing one of the most important units of genetics in Europe. But it was even worse. It was even worse. Um, this couple came to us, and uh, both of them were carried of this, uh, of this mutation. And this couple has been analyzed by one of the most important institutes in Milan in genetics, in neurogenetics. And this couple, as you can see, young couple, they had 
uh, child affected, dead 24 hours later, another one 24 hours later, two years later, and then in 98, spontaneous abortion at 10 weeks of gestation, and in 97, fetus affected, therapeutic abortion. So since the couple has been studied by uh, this institute, I asked it to the head uh, if we could give to them some cells from embryos to make the analysis. They agreed, but unluckily they were not able to handle. And what I received back was this sort of letter. I am extremely disappointed with the medical care that your center gave to Mrs. I am especially surprised by the behavior of Dr. Generali, who, even facing a completely new situation and in consideration of your total inexperience in plain plantation genetic diagnosis, never felt the need to discuss the correlated problems. And then if you go to the second line, it is necessary to make you to understand that Mrs. does not know what to do with the vague number of blastocysts frozen in the, your center if you cannot tell her which one to transfer and which one to discharge, and that was their duty actually. You are moving in a very dangerous ground. I hope that you realize it. So there was a lot of difficulties for what you call the pioneer in Italy to try to do something new. And then, just to conclude, because of the time, in 2004, the extremely restrictive law that was banning gamete and embryo donation, obligation only to generate three embryos and transfer them all simultaneously, ban on embryo cryopreservation, and ban on PGT for fertile couples. And then we had to fight and to go to the Supreme Court that ruled out this uh, two major um, restriction in 2009, and then in 2014 we were also able to go back to oversight and sperm donation, and just recently all the ban have been cancelled. This was a very difficult period for all the people, all the, what you call the pioneer, but all the operators in Italy, and I think that uh, we have to thank many people, including the international scientific community that via ASHRAE had the role to ask to an Italian guy to become chairman of the society. And I think that that was very brave from the pioneers of the international arena of uh, reproductive medicine. So let me just conclude saying that during those years, the full disasters came to Italy. Uh, these, for instance, are our data in which uh, we were blocked in doing PGD and in doing many other activities, and of course, all the knowledge, all the background of scientists and clinicians drop down. And it took a lot of time to rescue and to try to be back to normal. And as you can see from here, you see the uh, pregnancy rate in Europe in IVF and Dixie compared to IVF and Dixie in Italy. And as you can see, since the new law was put in place, still we struggled until a few years ago to get the same result that Europe had. And that was due to the law that had been finished. So, I'd like to conclude and finish just saying that uh, since uh, the beginning of the history of IVF, we have just increased dramatically the indications. So we went from tubal obstruction to ovarian failure to many other activities, including genetic disorders. And more we are passing with the ears, more technologies are aware and are able to cover more and more indication for our patient. And as you can see, Italian people, oops, sorry, Italian people have contributed anyway to, uh, to the field. Um, so the only thing I wanted to say is this is what we have done, and uh, this is uh, what is going to happen in the next few years, probably if we will continue to be part of the, of the show of reproductive medicine, because this is a show from the good point of view, of course, not from the bad viewpoint of the world. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.